Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm going back to my Pico Roots, the PIO Chronicles. Last time we got a tiny OLED screen to display bitwise data from an RP2350. This time I want to add a small keyboard to interact with the Pico. Since I'm comfortable with PIO, it just feels right to use that for scanning the keyboard. So why don't you join me as we add a specialized keyboard to the Raspberry Pi Pico. I want to create a small platform for the Pico that will allow the user to interact with it without the need for a separate computer and display monitor. The first step is getting an OLED display to work, which we did last time. Now I want to integrate a small 24 switch keyboard in with the unit. Since the Pico only has a total of 26 GPIO pins available, I won't be able to simply connect each key switch to a GPIO pin. I'll have to use keyboard scanning to keep the GPIO count down to a reasonable level. Scanning of switches for keyboards is very common. The switches are connected in a matrix of rows and columns where one side of the switch is connected to a row and the other side is connected to a column. Let's look at this example of a 16 switch keyboard arranged in a 4x4 matrix. In this case, the row acts as the supply and the switched output is sensed on the column side. By sequentially energizing the rows and then monitoring the columns, a switch press of any key can be identified. Things get more complicated when multiple keys are pressed at once. For instance, if these three keys were pressed at the same time, current would backflow through this switch and cause ghosting. The keyboard controller would see a ghost key in this position even though it isn't pressed. This can be solved by installing diodes on the output of each switch to prevent current backflow. Luckily, the keyboard I'm building only uses one button press at a time, so I can dispense with the diodes. I'll arrange my 24 switch keyboard in a matrix of four rows by six columns. Like the example, each row will be sequentially energized, and then the columns will be sensed for a key press. Let's build the keyboard. I also want to include the display and a Pico on the same board. Unfortunately, the prototyping boards that I have are just a little too small to fit everything. Since I only need a couple extra rows of solder pads, I'll add a little section onto the board. I'll cut and file the extra section to width and then super glue it to the other board using some tissue soaked in super glue on top and bottom as reinforcement. Even though the resulting joint is almost as strong as the solid board, I'll try not to put any undue stress on it. I'll install these small tactile switches from Amazon on the board. There are four connections to each switch, two on one side and two on the other. In order to keep them nice and straight, I 3D printed a little fixture to hold them in alignment while I soldered them in. I took advantage of the two contacts per pole to connect the switch rows together without additional wire. This left a clear path for the column wires, which didn't require insulation. For debugging and demonstration, I added one LED per row so I could observe the row scanning. I also added a header for the Pico on the back of the board and a header for the OLED display on the front. I connected the four rows to the Pico's GPIO 12 through 15 and the six columns to GPIO 6 through 11. The RP2040's programmable input-output is an excellent choice for continuously scanning the keyboard. PIO frees up the main core for other applications. When a key is pressed, PIO will scan the keyboard, identify which key was pressed, and then send an interrupt to the main core. The interrupt routine will then determine what action should be taken for the given key press. Let's go through the program. The PIO program is broken into three major parts. The first is to check to see if any key is pressed. Next, if a key is pressed, the rows are scanned to determine which key was pressed. Finally, after the key has been identified, the program will wait until it detects the key has been released before it goes back to scanning for the next key press. Switch debouncing is naturally incorporated between each section. Let's look at each section in detail. To check if any key is pressed, I'll turn on all the rows. Then I'll check to see if the, any of the columns have been energized. If no columns are energized, then no key has been pressed, and the program will continuously loop, reading the columns until there is a key energized. When that happens, 
execution moves to the next section. Here, each row will be energized one at a time. The row number is saved along with the results of the column read for each row. If no column is energized, the row and column results are discarded and the next row is energized. This continues until an energized column is detected, meaning that a key was pressed. At that time, the results are passed to the main MicroPython program and the PIO program moves to the next section. In this section, all rows are again energized and the column inputs are once again monitored, checking to see if no key is pressed. When all the columns are de-energized, indicating that no key has been pressed, then the PIO program will jump back to the beginning and start checking for the next key to be pressed. That's pretty straightforward, but the challenge is to make it happen in only 32 instructions using limited registers. Let's dive into the gory details. I developed the PIO program while I was away on a family trip. Since I only had access to a laptop without the C++ C++ toolchain, I developed the PIO program using MicroPython. Eventually, I'll convert the scanning routine to C++ C++ to be consistent with the rest of the applications that will be used on this board. As a reminder, in MicroPython, PIO programs are combined with the main program into a single file. I'll start in the main MicroPython program by setting GPIO 6 through 11 as inputs with pull-down resistors. Then I'll call the PIO assembler and reserve four GPIO outputs as set pins, four GPIO outputs as out pins, and set the output shift register to shift right, which will output the least significant bit first. During the instantiation process later, I'll assign the out pins and the set pins to the same pin group, GPIO 12 through 15. Now let's get into the PIO program. I'll set the wrap target location to the beginning of the PIO program, as well as the label begin again. Then I'll load the OSR with the following binary word. Because there is no PIO arithmetic and extremely limited PIO logic capabilities, I've hard-coded the row sequence into this word in order to cram everything into 32 instructions. The row sequence is repeated twice, once for selecting the row and once for memorializing the row number. This is the workaround for having only the Y scratch register to work with. Those of you who are familiar with the RP2040's PIO are now yelling at the screen, what about the X register? Well, to provide continuous row sequencing, I pull the output shift register and load it with the special sequencing word whenever it's empty. However, to keep the main program overheads low, I only want to send the sequencing word to the transmit FIFO one time. You may remember that PIO treats a non-blocking pull of an empty transmit FIFO into the OSR the same as moving the X scratch register into the OSR. So the X register's sole function in this program is to hold the special sequencing word to reload it into the OSR whenever the OSR is empty. As soon as the OSR is loaded with the sequencing word, I'll move it into the X register where it will sit for the rest of eternity, or at least until the program ends. Now we're ready to check for any key presses. I'll turn on all the rows using a set pins 15 instruction. Then I'll input the six columns into the input shift register and move the ISR into the Y scratch register to test if any key has been pressed. If the Y register is empty, meaning no column is energized and no key pressed, I'll jump back to start scan where we'll check the status again. Note that I'm running the PIO program very slowly with many delay cycles added this is to help in debugging and demonstrating the program in this video. When I implement the program fully in C, C++, I'll reduce the delays to only those needed for proper switch debouncing. If a key press is detected, we move to the key identification section. First, I'll check to see if the OSR is empty. If it is, I'll jump to the beginning of the program and fill it with the sequence word again. This will also restart key detection again, which results in inherent switch debouncing. 
If the OSR is not empty, then clear the input shift register and output the first four bits of the output shift register to the GPIO for row selection. Input the six column GPIOs into the ISR and then move it into the Y scratch register for zero testing. Input the second duplicate four bits from the OSR into the ISR. This will result in a unique 10-bit key identifier with the column results in the six most significant bits and the row selection in the four least significant bits. Drain off the duplicate bits in the OSR with the out pins four. This will set up the OSR to output the next row selection if needed. Finally, test the Y scratch register. If the result is zero, then we know that there is no key pressed in that row and will return to check the next row, discarding the ISR in the process. If a key press was detected for a given row, then we output the result of the ISR to the main program. In this case, I'll just use a push instruction, but in the future, I'll set up an interrupt. After the key code has been output to the main program, it enters the last section where it waits for the key to be released. Again, we turn on all the rows. Then we input all the columns using in pins six. Move the ISR into the Y register for zero testing. If the result is zero, meaning no button is pressed, then jump back to the beginning of the PIO program. But if the result isn't zero, jump back to the beginning of the check button off routine. That's the end of the PIO program. Continuing through the main program, I'll instantiate the state machine. This instruction instantiates state machine zero with PIO program KB scan. The clock rate of the state machine is set at two kilohertz. Finally, we will assign the set base pin to GPIO 12, the out base pin also to GPIO 12, and the in base pin to GPIO 6. Next, I'll start the PIO state machine using this instruction. After the state machine is started, I'll load the special sequence word into the transmit FIFO. Finally, I'll enter an endless loop where we print the key code with a 10-bit binary number. The six most significant bits represent the columns, and the four least significant bits are the rows. Let's try it out. When the program first starts, the column inputs are initialized and we see the GPIO numbers printed. Then all the rows are energized, shown by the green LEDs. After a key is pressed, the rows are sequenced one at a time, stopping when the row with the press key is reached. At that point, the result is printed. Notice how the printed binary number represents the column and row status. Then all the rows are energized again, waiting for the key to be released. When the key is finally released, all rows are energized again, waiting for the next key press. Success! Thanks for joining me today. This time we made a 24 switch keyboard that uses PIO scanning to free up the main processors. I'm really pleased with the result and plan on converting the program to C, C++, increasing the speed, and adding main program interrupt along with key decoding. So stay tuned. If you like this video or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.